understand and Lord when I this life shall leave just hold me in your hand Lord I stretch my hands to Stretch my hands to you. And, and I know for some of you, this is your first time back to church after quite a while. It's, it's great to have all of you here. And as well, we, we thank God for all the people who are able to watch us on the other side of that camera back there too. Welcome to, to worship today. Today we are in a sermon series, beginning a sermon series called Heroes of Faith. So we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 11, a, a lesson where we see all of these men of faith that are listed throughout history. And the writer of the Hebrews focuses on all these men for specific reasons. And my daughter asked me this last week what the sermon's going to be about, what the service is going to be about this next week. And, and I told her, the offering. And she had this look on her face like, what? The offering? But really, that's what we're looking at with Abel, the first person mentioned in this list of people, heroes of faith. He is known for really just one thing in history. We don't have anything recorded of what he said. We only have one act of what he did. He gave an offering. And so today we're going to be looking at Cain and Abel and the offering that was given there. And really, more than the offering, but rather what's going on at the heart, not just of Abel, but in our own hearts as well. Let's begin today with our opening hymn, Brothers, Sisters, Let Us Gladly. May God richly bless your worship today. Wisdom all controls. <laughs> 
Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful, Merciful Father, Father in heaven, heaven. I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O merciful creator, your hand is open wide to satisfy the needs of every living creature. Make us always thankful for your loving providence and grant that we, remembering the richness of your grace, may be faithful stewards of all your good gifts through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our first scripture reading for today comes from Genesis chapter 4, the lesson on Cain and Abel. In this lesson, as we think about where it's talked about in Hebrews chapter 11, we see Chapter 11 of Hebrews focuses on the offering that's given here. So, so think for a moment about what's going on in the heart of Cain and Abel, and you see that reflection of what's going on in their heart in their offering. It says this, Genesis chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. This is the word of our Lord. We'll continue with a hymn, two verses of hymn 486, Lord of Glory, You Have Bought Us.
Please stand for the gospel. The gospel lesson for today comes from Luke chapter 21. In this lesson, we see a poor widow who reflected what was going on in her, in her heart through the offering that she gave. Luke 21, starting at verse 1. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. And we'll continue with the children's devotion. However, we're not going to have the children come forward anymore. However, you can stay in your seat. All kids can just stay where you are. I think the big kids here, too, learn just as much from children's devotion as anyone else. So we'll just we'll continue with that. So I, I have a number of things I want to show you today. And, and really what we're thinking about is, first things for, first, the importance of making sure we get things in the right order. And so here's, here's the first one. Kids, you might have to sit up a little bit so you can see all these things, all right? So here's the first one. When your parents tell you to go brush your teeth, what would happen if you started brushing your teeth, and after you were done brushing your teeth, then you put the toothpaste on the toothbrush? That doesn't make sense. It's really important you get the order right, isn't it? How about this? Your parents tell you to go wash your hands, right? So you go in and you wash your hands, put your hands under the water, then you dry yourself off, and then you go and put some soap on your hands. Wouldn't work very well, will it? It's pretty important to get the first things first when it comes to that. How about this? You uh, get up in the morning, it's time to put your shoes and socks on, so you put your shoe on, and then you decide to try to put your sock on over it. It's pretty important to get first things first. Now, so you understand what comes first with that. Well, how about this? We have an offering basket and a cross. What comes first? Before you can give an offering, before you can put money into the basket, you need to know who Jesus is. And that's really what we're talking about today, to make sure that we understand who Jesus is. Because when we understand who Jesus is and what Jesus did for you, the fact that he gave up his entire life, that he who was rich became poor, to make us rich, it makes sense then, after knowing that, as he forgives our sins and promises a place in heaven for us, that we're going to give offerings to the Lord. But he can't go the other way. If someone doesn't know who Jesus is, it would make no sense to give an offering. So that's what we're all about here, is trying to make sure people know who Christ is. And, and through Christ, they're going to understand the true motivation, the proper motivation for giving an offering. Let's pray about that. Dear Jesus, we, we thank you. We thank you for coming into this world, and through what you did, you made us rich. You made us perfect through your life and your death and re your resurrection. And now because of that, we get to give you thanks in all that we do through our offerings and through our entire life. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's continue with our hymn of the day, hymn 480, verses 1 through 4. Thank you. 
earth, of sky, of sea, the gold, the silver, sparkling gem, the waving corn, the bending tree, are yours, you are but lending them. To you as early mornings do, our praises, gifts, and prayers shall rise, as rose and joy as earth was new. Faith's patriarchal sacrifice. We, Lord, would lay at your request the costliest offerings on your shrine. And when we give and give our best, we but return your gifts divine. For our sermon today, we're going to be looking at one of the first verses of Hebrews chapter 11, which focuses on Abel. It says this, Hebrews 11, verse 4, By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. This is God's word. I think it's interesting that when the writer to the Hebrews gives us a tour of the hall of fame of faith, that he starts with this guy, Abel, a person who we have nothing recorded in Scripture of anything that he ever said, and we really only see him doing one thing in the Bible. And the one thing that he does doesn't seem all that grand. He gives an offering. Usually when we think of a, of a great man of faith, we think of maybe somebody who gave hundreds of thousands of dollars to a charitable organization, or we think of somebody who dedicated their life to helping the poor, or we think of someone who traveled the world as a missionary, converted thousands, started hundreds of churches, right? See, what the writer of the Hebrews does here, as he begins with Abel in his hall of fame of faith, is that he, he turns these heroes into people that are achievable. He brings them down to our level. See, a lot of times heroes in our world, role models, are, would be maybe someone like Aaron Rodgers or LeBron James, people who, when you think about them, you'd say, I can never be like that. But Abel gave an offering. I can give an offering. We give offerings all the time. So what is it about this offering that the Lord puts him up on a pedestal for the world to see and says, what he did was absolutely beautiful. Be like this. Now, I've preached on Genesis 4 a number of times throughout my career as a pastor, and every time I've talked about Genesis chapter 4, the lesson on Cain and Abel, I've always focused on the fifth commandment, you shall not murder or some aspect of that, jealousy or anger or love your neighbor as yourself. But when the writer of the Hebrews talks about Genesis chapter 4, the lesson on Cain and Abel, he focuses almost entirely on this offering that Abel gave. It says this, By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. Now, at first it sounds as if God is comparing these two people pitting them against one another. But as you look at the text in Genesis chapter 4, what you see is that God is not the one doing the comparison. The one doing the comparing is Cain. And somehow, we don't know how, Cain knew that the Lord was not happy with his offering. And Cain knew that the Lord was happy with his brother Abel's offering. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine if God were here visibly. And during the offering, as you place money into the offering basket, God stands there with his thumb like this and looks at you and says, or, and wouldn't that be terrible? That'd be awfully nerve-wracking, right? Again, somehow Cain knew 
that the Lord was not pleased with his offering, but he was pleased with Abel's offering, and it enraged him. Today we're going to be thinking about what it is that makes a good offering. And one of the phrases I want you to think about today is this. It's not about the what, it's about the why. It's not about the what of the offering, it's about the why, the motivation behind the offering. See, Cain and Abel, they had two different professions. Abel was a shepherd. Cain was a farmer. And it's not that God liked the smell of burnt meat more than he liked the smell of burnt grain. It's not even necessarily that one gave a larger offering than the other, although we'll talk about that later. The real problem was something going on in Cain's heart. The real problem was something more difficult than just fixing it by throwing on more grain and more fruits of the soil. He couldn't just write out a bigger check to fix this problem. Because the problem was going on in his heart. Throughout Scripture, when the Bible talks about our offerings, our thankfulness to the Lord, it always seems to focus in on the heart first. Let me share this passage with you. A very short passage that gets to the heart of the matter. It says, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 says, God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Now think about that for a moment. That is not something you can just turn on when you want to. You can't just decide to be happy about something. It'd be like me telling my kids to clean their room. I can get my kids to clean their room. I can ask them, I can nag them, I can take away their Xbox, and I know eventually their room will get cleaned. But if I say to them, kids, I want you to clean your room joyfully out of love for your parents. Now that's a very different question, and not something they can just decide to do. And this was Cain's problem too. It was the motivation, the heart of the matter. It pained him to give his hard-earned dollars, in this case fruit, to the Lord. And we don't know exactly why. We don't know what the problem was in his heart. Maybe he saw it as an absolute waste of his hard work, the fruits of the soil, as he took them and put them on the altar and they just were burnt up. And he was thinking, boy, I could have used this for my family. They could have eaten this or I could have given it to the poor, but just burn it up, it's just a waste. And we can understand that. There can be people who look at giving donations to a church and saying, you know what, I don't like the way they're spending their money. They're wasting it. Or maybe the problem was pressure for Cain. That he knew Abel was going to give this big offering because he always gives such a generous offering and he didn't want to look bad in front of his family and so he he just gave only because he knew Abel was going to make him look bad if he didn't give something. We can understand that pressure. As an offering basket is passed around you think to yourself, well I guess we should throw something in. Maybe the problem was fear. Maybe Cain didn't know how the harvest season was going to end up and he had a big family and he didn't know how he was going to provide for them. And so instead of trust in the Lord, there was fear. And we can understand that. In a day and age where after the stock market has dropped and many of you have lost a lot of money in the stocks, some of you have lost jobs or lost hours in your jobs, the future seems uncertain, we get fear. And fear so easily can replace trust. Or maybe what Cain was struggling with was just an apathetic attitude towards the Lord. Instead of thankfulness to the Lord, the idea of giving an offering made him roll his eyes, made him yawn. He just didn't have that love for the Lord. But then there was Abel. Now Abel, he looked forward to the offering all week long. That was his favorite part of the worship service. And all week long, and during the, during the service that they had, whatever their worship looked like, he was thinking about that perfect world that his parents had described for him, of what it was like in Eden, that world that God created for his parents. 
And he ran through his mind a thousand times the story of that his parents told him about the serpent and the fruit from the tree that they were not supposed to eat from and how it ruined the world and, and now they had to deal with the consequences of those sins. And yet he remembered that promise so well. That immediately after their sin, God promised a Savior and he thought about that even though he wasn't able to experience the perfect world like his parents did, someday he would forever. And he thought about when the Savior would come, what he would be like, all that he would have to do in order to save him and forgive him. And put a smile on his face. And that was the motivation behind the offerings that he gave. In fact, if, if Abel erred in any way through his offering, it was that he gave more than what he could afford. Throughout the week, he, he worked harder and harder, he, he was motivated in order to maybe just give a little bit more in his offering. So when we look at those two, and this is the tough question we have to face today, does our offering typically look more like Abel's offering or Cain's offering? That's a humbling question, isn't it? But one thing to remember as we look at all these heroes of faith is that every one of them were sinners. And the real hero in this hall of fame of faith is Christ. See, Abel knew that he was righteous, not because of how big his offering was, not because of his life of thankfulness, or because he made this hall of fame of faith, no. He knew he was righteous because of a Savior who was coming. And he knew very little about the Savior who was coming. He knew very few details. All he knew was the promise that his parents told them. The promise that God made to Satan and to the world. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That's all he knew. He knew that at some time in history, there would be this battle between God and Satan. And this Savior would crush the head of Satan. And all the work that he did in the Garden of Eden would be undone. But he also knew that this Savior would be injured, tortured in some way, sacrificed for him and for his salvation. The writer of the Hebrews says it this way, By faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. While he didn't know the details of what this Savior would do, he knew that at the end of it all, he would stand as righteous. Friends, you and I know many more details than Abel knew about this Savior who came. We know specific details of when he was born, how he came about, the different miracles that he performed throughout his life, his compassion to so many people, the gruesome details of his torture and his death and his resurrection. And afterwards, he says these amazing promises like, because I live, you also will live, he says. We have more reason than able to be thankful to what our Savior has done for us. And in spite of the fact that at times our offerings may look more like Cain's than Abel's, in spite of the fact that we too often focus on the what of the offering rather than the why, you stand as righteous. Just like Abel. Because of Christ. Do you ever think about what that word means, righteous? It's one of those church words that we kind of throw around a little too often without really thinking about what it all entails. The word righteous in its basic definition means straight or level. And it came to mean this idea of, of perfection and holiness. And it's really, in the Bible, one of the main attributes of God, that God is righteous. This is what it says in Isaiah 45. It says, There is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none but me. He is the lone being in the universe who is righteous. And yet throughout Scripture, when you look at that word, there's another aspect of that word that you'll see is that that is the one attribute that God continues to seek to give to us. 
He seeks to give to us his righteousness. So in Romans chapter 3, this is what it says. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Through Christ, God seeks to make us righteous. On the day that he was crucified, the day that he rose from the dead, he declared that you are righteous. In spite of who we are, in spite of what we've done, that's the declaration that he made about you and me. So that our God, our Savior, came down to our level to take us up to his level. And he puts us up on a pedestal just like Abel to show the world how beautiful we have been made because of Christ. You are righteous. You are perfect. You are holy, he says. And it's that righteousness from God that is the motivation for our offerings and our entire life. It's not about the what, it's about the why. But when the why is in the right place, you're going to notice a difference in the what. Did you follow that? Let me explain. In Genesis chapter 4, we see the lesson on Cain and Abel. Listen closely to the difference between these two offerings. And, and it seems as if there was some type of a visible difference between the offering of Cain and the offering of Abel. Listen closely. I think you'll be able to catch it here. Verse 3, it says... In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. He doesn't mention first fruits or, or the best of the crop, uh, just some fruits of the soil. But then he says in verse 4, And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Fat portions, firstborn of his flock. He gave the best of the best seems that there was some type of a visible difference between those two offerings, which makes sense. There's a difference between what's going on in the heart. There's going to be a noticeable difference between what comes out of that heart and the offerings of thankfulness that come from it. Same is true for us, too. The importance of making sure the why is in the right place, and I guarantee you the what of that offering is going to naturally flow out of love for your Savior out of thankfulness to your Savior. And that's one of the main reasons, I believe, why why Abel is mentioned here in this Heroes of Faith chapter. To be held up as this example of a person who gave a simple offering that when your heart is in the right place, what comes from that is going to naturally flow from it. It says this in, in Hebrews chapter 11, And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. Abel still speaks even though he is dead. Thousands of years later, we continue to talk about what Abel did. He still speaks. The Lord holds him up as an example to everyone to make sure our hearts are in the right place before we give an offering. And when our hearts are in the right place, the offering naturally flows from it. I'm a little sad that we cannot have the offering in the same way that we used to have the offering. You can't pass the plates anymore for, for coronavirus reasons. Um, however, there's a lot of history behind that, why we have the offering in the place in the service that we do, that after hearing your confession of your own sins and then the fact that you are forgiven because of Christ and that confession and absolution at the beginning of the service, after hearing three different readings about God's word and, and all that God has done for you, after hearing the creed, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and thinking about what God and Jesus has done for you so that you know that you are saved, then it's time for the offering. As we hear that gospel proclaimed to you, then we are ready to give thanks to God. And even though we don't have the offering plate at that specific part of the service anymore, there is something beautiful about the way we can do it now as well where there's no comparison between what this person gave or what that person gave, but this is truly something between you and your God. As you give an offering online or through a text message or you write a check in the privacy of your home and send it to the church or even just drop it in the basket on the way out, 
This is something between you and your God, a way that you get to give thanks to him directly. So friends, enjoy the offering today. As you consider how your God made you righteous, in spite of who we are, but through Christ, may our offering and our entire lives reflect what he made us. Amen. Please stand. Let's confess together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. You'll see in front of you a slide for the offering. However, we're not going to take an offering right now. And there's no, a number of different options uh, for you to give an offering. And we talked about that extensively in the sermon. Um, most importantly is as we consider what our God has done for us. And we pray that that is the motivation behind your offerings to the Lord. There is going to be a, ba- there is a basket on the way out today if you'd like to give an offering that way. We are going to continue with the prayer of the church. And... Before we jump into the prayers, I want to direct your attention to those who are in our announcement sheet. We do not have bulletins here. However, uh, if you'd like to see the announcements and the prayers, you can go online um, on our website and you can see both the bulletin and all the announcements uh, for this week. And included in that is our prayers. Praying for Hazel Miller, who is hospitalized, and praying for Barb Phillips, who's going to be having surgery this coming week. Also, Karen Murray is under hospice care, so we'll continue to keep her and her family in our prayers. Praying for comfort for the families of Joanne Hayden and Dawn Freed at the death of their father, Warren Matsky. And a number of people are celebrating wedding anniversaries. Uh, Pastor Bader and Connie, Dan and Kathy Braund, uh, Matthew and Betty Van Loon, Mike and Mary Pepper. And I, on the way in today, I heard some other people who are celebrating anniversaries as well. So let's keep all of the people who are celebrating anniversaries uh, this week and this month in our prayers today. We pray. Lord Jesus, Abel gave an offering that was a reflection of his trust in the promise of a Savior who was going to come to make him righteous and, gave, and give back the perfect world that his parents lost. Maintain in us that same trust in the Savior who came and who makes us righteous through his sacrifice. Create in us a godly motivation in our offerings and in our life of service to you. That in everything we do, whether it's our offerings or our life, it's all done out of thanks and love to a God who sacrificed his son for our salvation. We pray for those who are struggling physically right now, especially Hazel Miller and Barb Phillips. We pray that the assurance of your abiding presence and loving care comforts and sustains them as Barb undergoes surgery and as Hazel recovers. Remove all anxiety and fear and lead them to rest all their confidence in you. Bring them back to full strength according to your will. Eternal Father, you alone make decisions about life and death. We implore your mercy on Karen Murray, whose departure from this life seems near at hand. As she passes through the valley of the shadow of death, comfort her with faith's assurance that you are with her and that she need not be overcome by fear. Encourage her and her loved ones with the sure hope of the glory that you have prepared for your believers in heaven. We pray for the family of Warren Matsky, the father of Joanne Hayden and Dawn Freed, whom you have taken to yourself by death. Be with them and comfort them in their sorrow with your sure promises of the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And today we rejoice with all those who are celebrating wedding anniversaries. We ask you to continue to fill their hearts with the unselfish love that reflects your sacrificial love for them so that their love for each other may never grow weary. With every joy and sorrow that they share, bring them closer to each other and to you, their God and Lord. 
Encourage all husbands and wives as they seek to fulfill their marriage promises and bless all our homes with your abiding peace. In your name we pray all of this. Amen. And please stand for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Continue with our closing hymn by faith.
mountain shall be moved, and the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible, for all who call upon his name, we will stand. Good morning, everyone. It's great to have all of you back in the church again. It's great, wonderful. Good, good to have you here. And then uh, a few announcements. One is that, uh, again, you can download both the bulletin and all the announcements on our website. Uh, you can check those things out, things that are happening. A few things to highlight. We are going to continue to have the Saturday night service at 5 p.m. be a mask-required service. And... Uh, the, the limit of attendance is a little bit lower than all the other services, um, and no congregational singing will happen in that service. So just keep that in mind as you sign up for future uh, services. On Wednesday nights at 6.30, we're going to be having a Zoom Bible class based on the sermons uh, throughout the sermon series. So this Wednesday, if you'd like to uh, join us for that Zoom Bible class, uh, we'll be, again, revisiting Abel and Cain and what happened in Genesis 4 and relating it to to Hebrews chapter 11. So if you're interested in joining that, you can email me or, or any one of our pastors and we'll put you on the sign-up list so that you can jump into that Zoom Bible study. Today, the ushers are going to usher you out, uh, which I know we haven't done that for a while now, but they're going to start from the back and usher you out from the back and then make their way forward this way, just so we don't have a bottleneck at the doors. Wonderful to see all of you here. Um, God's blessings on your week. Thank you.